As we walked, the landscape changed again. The path narrowed and the rock faces towered above us. We were entering a canyon, a lost world hidden away from the scorching plain. In arid landscapes, canyons like this offer immense protection for anyone who's lost. Perhaps the most important thing is that the geology here helps you to find water. Firstly, because when there's a change in the stratas, you often find water coming to the surface. But also, these tight canyons help to shade the water from the sun, which means it doesn't evaporate. And of course, water means life. This is the track of a lion cub. It seems that everybody enjoys this gorge that's cool, there's nice water here. But naturally, there's one question on my mind. If that's the cub, where's the mum? This could have been a menacing place, but actually it was cool and peaceful with the solemnity of a great medieval cathedral. For me, it had a powerful atmosphere. I wondered what Mateli thought. <laughs> This gorge is made by God for everything because it is, this is made for human beings to drain their cow here and the vultures to lay their eggs. And when he brings cow, the, he gets the fresh water and cold and cows will not be attacked by, by predators. As we rested in the shade, Mateli decided to make a tonic. He unearthed a root that would provide the medicinal ingredient. It was clear to see just how comfortable the Maasai are in the bush. Once we all lived in a similar way, but today most of us have lost this intimacy with our surroundings. As the ultimate goal for our walk through the gorge, Mateli wanted to show me a very special place, symbolic for the Maasai. Is that uh, Malenga? Yeah, that's Malenga. What was the Mon story about that? Ore mbe ro nyi langai, aga ge ore jara ro do nyi ra wangai na osunyi ro. The mountains is active, it's volcano active. So the Maasai believe the mountain is created by God, and that was active. And the master normally go to pray under that mountain. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there's a story because they believe if women go there under that mountain, for those who do not get babies, they get babies. <laughs> and that's why the name started from from there. That's what does the, the mountain mean? Yeah, uh, the mountain means. The Olunyelangai means the mountain of God. The mountain of God. Yeah. 
It was a fitting place to end our safari, though I've always felt that the journey is more important than the destination. Thank you very much. I was sad to be leaving. So long. <laughs> what a nice man. As I watched Mitteli walk away, I thought about his world, a natural world in which he is king. He seemed in harmony with this world, which is in complete contrast to the white hunters who came on safari with their rifles in search of trophies. The great white hunters mercilessly exploited nature for financial gain. Today attitudes may have changed. These days talk of wildlife often goes hand in hand with conservation. Even hunters must face the reality that our ancestors knew, that you must never take more than the land can provide. In the 19th century, the idea of conserving wildlife rather than plundering it for profit was still relatively new. Strangely enough, one of the greatest conservationists of the age, Frederick Salou, began his career as a hunter. But what set him apart was that he was one of the first people to realize that the stocks of wild animals were diminishing in the hail of lead being let fly by European hunters. Frederick Courtney Salou is one of my all-time heroes. Born into a long line of wealthy bankers, he bucked the trend and spent his life in Africa studying wildlife. His passion for the natural world started when he was a schoolboy at rugby. In his account of his childhood, he describes how as a boy of nine he used to go out on night forays into the woods nearby, how he would go bird nesting, and how in the winter he trapped water rats, weasels and stoats for their furs. I can sympathise. I've always had a passion for the natural world, and as a boy spent my nights alongside animals such as badgers, foxes and stoats. I admire this champion of African wildlife who spoke out against the norm of wanton destruction. His fame even attracted the attention of the President of the United States, Theodore Roosevelt, who having read Selou's memoirs, African Nature Notes and Reminiscences, became hooked himself on his own version of conservation. He and Selou started a long and impassioned correspondence in which they discussed detailed observations they were making about nature and animal behaviour. Salou's keen eye for nature is reflected in the highly detailed drawings he made of the animals he hunted. He also organised what may have been the biggest safari of all time, Roosevelt's legendary safari with this astonishing retinue, almost 300 strong. Animals were killed in droves, but always in the name of education. It's difficult for us to understand how killing and conservation could go together, but we must judge them by their day, and these were the earliest days of conservation. It wasn't until later that trophy hunting was challenged by the new interest of nature conservation, with its emphasis on understanding animals rather than stuffing them. Another early start to meet a man who spends his life on safari filming wildlife for television. His understanding of animal behaviour and his ability to capture it on film comes from a life spent in the bush. Good morning. Hello. Warren, I presume. That's correct. Very nice to meet you. Hi there, Rick. Isn't that a beautiful morning? Yeah, it's stunning, isn't it? Fantastic. Yeah. Amazing light. Yeah. Have you seen anything yet? No, not yet. Um, we're just looking up for uh, cheetahs at the moment. Warren Samuels has been a cameraman working here for 20 years, making his living filming wildlife. It's this precise and painstaking study which I call bushcraft, the fine tune